All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started with Grand Rounds uh, this week. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we have our CO CME code in the upper right of the screen, as always, so make note of that if you need CME credit. Uh, today we have Dr. Katherine Lyons, who's joining us to discuss weight loss management in the COVID-19. Just kidding, no COVID this week, bad joke. Um, but Dr. Katherine Lyons is joining us, and we're pleased to have her. Um, Dr. Lyons is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and Metro Health Medical Center. Dr. Lyons started her undergraduate education at John Carroll University and then went on to earn, earn her medical degree at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She continued her training with a residency in internal medicine here at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center. Since finishing residency last year in June, Dr. Lyons has been practicing obesity medicine and primary care at Metro Health. Buckeye, Broadway, and Beachwood locations. Dr. Lyons' current academic interests include developing an obesity medicine fellowship program at Metro Health and development of continuing education for Metro Health's weight management nurse practitioners. She is also currently involved in a project analyzing the outcomes of diabetic patients seen in Metro Health's weight loss surgery and weight management center. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lyons. Thank you very much. I am very honored to be back here today. Um, thank you to Dr. Armitage and um, the Department of Medicine for having me. Um, so today, what we're going to talk about um, is the interaction between obesity, type 2 diabetes, and prediabetes. And um, the tagline for this talk is rethinking our approach to the spectrum of metabolic disease. So our objectives for today, we're going to describe the current and combined treatment paradigms for obesity and type 2 diabetes. We're going to outline the current guidelines of treatment, uh, for treatment of obesity in patients with type 2 diabetes. And then we'll summarize the evidence for effectiveness of different therapies. And what I really want you to walk away with today is um, the idea that there's an integrated office-based treatment model that follows the national guidelines and evidence-based practice for treating type 2 diabetes and obesity. And just a disclaimer, I'm not going to be talking in great detail about all of the treatment options, but we will give you a broad overview. Um, so for those of you who think more in outline terms, there's kind of two halves to this talk. We're going to start with where we're at now and then what we can do. Um, no conflicts or disclosures. So the current landscape of um, our population in the United States today with respect to obesity, overweight, prediabetes, and type 2 diabetes is that it's a significant problem. So 31.5% um, of U.S. adults follow, fall into the criteria of being overweight. Um, almost 40% are obese, so that's a BMI of 30 and above. About a third have prediabetes. 8.5% um, have type 2 diabetes. And of those patients with type 2 diabetes, 87.5% uh, of them struggle with being overweight or obese. So it's very prevalent, and when I was training as a resident, um, I was consistently seeing patients who were struggling with these issues, and it brought up the question for me, if issues with weight, overweight and obesity, are affecting over half of our patients, why aren't we doing more to actively address it? And also, how can we provide a practical care paradigm for patients with diabetes and obesity that focuses on treating the underlying drivers of disease rather than just temporizing the disease process? And that's really the launching point for this talk today. So our current paradigm is this. We have two separate bubbles. One we put obesity in, one is diseases of insulin resistance. Um, and we may do something to address the insulin resistance, but we're really not doing much to touch the obesity. But as you can see, this is actually an overlapping issue. So they're not occurring separately. Um, here we have two prevalence maps. So on the left is the prevalence of obesity and on the right is for diabetes. And if you would imagine a map for prediabetes, it would fall somewhere right in between the two of these. So they're not exactly identical, but as you can see, there's a significant amount of overlap between the prevalence of these two diseases. So we certainly do have patients who are lean and diabetic. We have patients who are overweight or obese without diabetes, but by and large, these are occurring in the same individuals. So what we have now um, is a difficult cycle of metabolic disease. So we start with sedentary lifestyle, hypercaloric diet, weight gain promoting medications, issues with sleep, unhealthy environments, and chronic stress that over time lead to our patients gaining weight. Maybe someone will tell them the old adage, you know, do less eating, do more exercising, but a lot of people don't even get that. 
Over time, this causes patients to progress to insulin resistance for a large portion of them, and eventually type 2 diabetes. That's the point where we usually notice that something is wrong, and we'll put a Band-Aid on it. We give them some antihyperglycemics, about half of which are going to lead to worsening weight gain. And over time, it gets patients in this really, really difficult cycle that is hard for them to break on their own. And so where it gets us is the house is on fire, and we really don't have the tools to address what's going on. What we need to move towards is recognizing that these are twin epidemics. So the term was coined around 2011 um, in the literature of diabetes. It's a little bit corny, but I think it does a great job at getting to the underlying concept that these are overlapping. Um, and they really are falling along the spectrum of metabolic dysregulation, just at, at, at different points in that. So we know that metabolic disease is chronic and progressive, and if we don't change how we're looking at it and how we're treating at it, things will get worse for our patients. So we need to take our paradigm from looking like this to this. And what happens if we do this? So if we treat type 2 diabetes and obesity together, we can delay the progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. We can improve glycemic control and reduce medication requirements for our patients who are already diabetic. And we can improve the associated comorbidities. So we're doing a lot by adopting this integrated paradigm. And it's actually in the current rec recommendations for these um, two diseases. So the separate society, so the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommends that lifestyle therapy is the foundation of treatment for type 2 diabetes, and the Obesity Society recommends that lifestyle modification is the foundation of treatment for obesity. So it's already there in the guidelines. We are just not adapting it and combining it for our patients. So that takes us to the next part of our talk. What can we actually do about this? Um, so I want to start by talking about how we can actually identify these diseases for our patients and provide some initial counseling. So the recommended screening, it varies slightly depending on which society you're looking at. I usually go um, by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists screening guidelines, and that recommends that when you're screening for prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, you should do it once every three years for individuals over 45. And then for people who are 45 years and younger, you should be doing it if they have risk factors. Um, I will say I, I do primary care at uh, Metro Health Buckeye location. I do have a significant portion of younger patients in my practice. And I was surprised when I moved over there at how many cases of prediabetes I'm picking up in my younger population. Um, and I screen simply because they do have a higher BMI and sedentary lifestyle as risk factors. And then once we diagnose someone with prediabetes, we should be getting an annual A1C to detect if there is progression to type 2 diabetes. For obesity, we should be getting an annual measurement of height and weight and calculating a BMI. And I really think that we've done a better job being aware of the BMI um, in the more recent years as EMR usage has become more widespread. While we're talking about screening, I think that we also need to address the fact that we should screen for underlying comorbidities that can drive worsening type 2 diabetes and obesity. And so there's a lot on here. The ones I will highlight that I see missed often, um, sleep apnea is a big one for our patients, um, and it can have significant ramifications in terms of their disease process. Um, depression and other mental health issues can also affect patients significantly. Um, fatty liver is one in our patients who struggle with being overweight, obese. Um, they, they often, that often goes undetected. Um, and then polycystic ovarian syndrome, that has um, an entire metabolic component to it, and if we don't address that, that can have some serious ramifications for issues with weight. So how do we do with this right now? Um, so when we survey, this is from Medicare Expenditure Panel Survey data of U.S. physicians. And so when we look at how, um, they, they looked at how U.S. physicians did screening for um, three different primary care topics, so tobacco use, obesity, and alcohol use. And I want to just highlight the, the obesity um, line. So we do an okay job screening, so 78.6% of patients who should have been screened were screened. However, only 53.5% actually received any appropriate follow-up counseling. So we do okay with screening, but then we don't know what to tell our patients afterwards. And so why does this happen? It actually happens early. It stems from, from our training early on in residency. So um, this work comes from um, Dr. Eileen Seeholder and her team over at Metro Health. And they did surveys of 22 
um, different programs, and they surveyed the primary care specialty residents, so family medicine, internal medicine, and OBGYN. And they asked them about their comfort level counseling on a variety of preventive care topics. And if you see highlighted there, physical activity and nutrition were two of those, and we didn't do very well. So overall, 19% um, reported that they were comfortable counseling patients on physical activity, 11% reported they were comfortable counseling patients on nutrition, and here we are in internal medicine, we fall right on par with that. Um, so we're not very comfortable with it, even in our early training. I do want to point out, though, that we actually do an okay job mentioning the linkage between the need for prevention and the development of these diseases down the line. So um, we actually do counsel and mention that type 2 diabetes and heart disease can be affected by these behaviors. But again, we still just don't really know how to convey to patients what they should be doing. And that carries forward into our work as attending. So when they surveyed U.S. primary care physicians about why they weren't counseling patients on obesity and type 2 diabetes and lifestyle modifications, uh, they cited that the majority of individuals cited that they felt that they had a lack of education and training on these topics. Um, they also cited, you know, not having enough time, that patients weren't interested, they felt like they didn't have the appropriate support, and that patients were just overall too complex to address these issues. So, we don't have the tools starting in residency, and then moving forward as attendings, we still aren't able to provide our patients with the care that they need. So this is hard for us as physicians, but I also want you to appreciate how difficult this is for our patients. Um, so I have a short clip that is from the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and it was developed in conjunction with Ethicon to explain to patients um, the the linkages of obesity, chronic disease, and how the pathophysiology of that works out. All right, so that set point makes it really difficult for our patients to fight their natural biology and sustain weight loss over time. So I think it's important to appreciate metabolic disease is complex and challenging to treat for both patients and providers. So we need to know how we can do everything we can to help our patients. So that brings us to treatment goals and options. So here I want to use a case vignette. Um, this is one of my patients. So Mr. P, he's a 48-year-old male. He has class 3 obesity. His BMI is 47. His weight is 357 pounds. Um, he has some hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's pre-diabetic. He has untreated sleep apnea and some chronic right shoulder pain from a prior rotator cuff injury. And so he comes into clinic for a primary care visit. Um, he's a single dad. He works in a manufacturing plant, but he's been put on light duty due to his shoulder issues. His weight is up 17 pounds, so that's a 5% weight gain from his initial body weight um, at last visit. So prior to today, he had his labs drawn, and his A1C has worsened. It went from 6.8 to 7.5%. So we reviewed the results of his blood work and discussed the significance of his new diabetes diagnosis. He looks concerned and asks, Doc, how can I fix this? So what would you tell him? Dr. Armitage, did you have something? Yeah, is that a rhetorical question? If you have, no, if you have something to answer, please chime in. Exercise and carbohydrate restriction. I, I like that. We're going to elaborate on that just a little bit more. <laughs> so how confident are you that you can partner with him to create an evidence-based action plan? 
So just think about that to yourself as we go through this. I would refer to you. I appreciate that. Um, so first, I would like to identify and establish what our treatment goals are. So what are we trying to achieve with this? What is clinically meaningful weight loss? So what we're shooting for initially is a weight loss of 5 to 10% from the baseline body weight. Um, overall, what our goal is is to reduce fat mass, increase lean body mass, improve fitness, and then improve overall metabolic parameters. Um, really, my goal as a provider is I want to help my patients to live healthier, better, more fulfilled lives. And the other piece of this I want to stress is that a 5% weight gain is also clinically significant. So if we go back to Mr. P, he gained 5%, and that is part of what pushed him over from that 6.8 to 7.5. It pushed him from prediabetes over into that type 2 diabetes. So that weight gain is significant. And so why do we care about 5 to 10% weight loss to start? So we know that around 5% is where we start to see improvements in metabolic parameters like A1C, blood pressure, and cholesterol. And those improve the more weight that you lose. So that leads us to how do we do this? So what are our actual treatment options? And today I'm going to talk about um, lifestyle therapy, some different medications that we use, and also the role of bariatric surgery. So as I referenced before, these are the two current treatment outlines for type 2 diabetes from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, and then um, the obesity treatment pyramid from the Obesity Society. And as I mentioned, they both have, if you look here, lifestyle therapy is supposed to be the foundation of therapy for type 2 diabetes, and we also see it here for the treatment of obesity. So how do we do this? How do we actually help patients with lifestyle therapy? So there are some key components that I think are essential to formulating any sort of treatment plan for a patient. So we need to work on the key components of nutrition, physical activity, but then also behavior therapy, and that's a key piece. A lot of times patients already know what they should be doing. They just don't know how to do it, and so that's a lot of what I, I help patients with. And then also another piece that is essential for, for sustained weight loss in the long term is helping patients figure out how they can do self-monitoring, and that's a key piece for any piece of chronic disease management. So how I do this in the office um, usually on one of my initial visits with the patient, I will have them delve a little bit deeper into what the environment they live in looks like and what their day-to-day -day life looks like. Um, so for Mr. P, he's a single dad. He lives with his son. He does the food purchasing. He can afford food just fine. He doesn't have any food insecurities. He doesn't live in a food desert. Um, he can cook, but he doesn't have a lot of time. And a key piece for him is he actually had a new girlfriend who had lost weight with a low-carb diet and um, some weight loss medication called Sexenda, which was excellent. So he had, he had a partner in all this. Um, he knew how to read food labels, and he actually had an extensive diet history in the past. So he had tried everything. This is often the case for the patients who come to me. They are tired of dieting. Um, they've tried them all, and none of them have really worked for them long term. Um, and then I always take an exercise history as well. So for him, he's had some experience with running. It bothers his knees. He does have some access to equipment, um, but again, he just doesn't have a lot of time to exercise. So when we talk about lifestyle modifications and those key components, um, nutrition is a big piece of that. So we'll start with talking about how we approach nutrition for patients. Uh, so when I'm in the clinic, I usually take a dietary recall for patients. Um, so I walk them through what they typically do on most days for meals, what time they're doing it, what sorts of things they do. Um, and then also I include a screen for any sort of eating disordered behaviors. Um, so, you know, any binge eating, food cravings, emotional eating. Um, so for Mr. P, he was doing a, he was meal skipping, so he wasn't eating breakfast. He might grab some fast food on the way to work some days. Um, everything was on the go. A lot of fast food was involved. Um, he wasn't drinking soda, which was great. Um, but he really also wasn't getting the recommended amounts of vegetables and fruit that he should be having per week. And no real eating disorder behavior for him, but he did note that he had a big appetite. And so the last set of questions asking about, you know, particular food behaviors, appetite history, things like that, that can help direct us later when we start to think about the medications that we're going to use. And so when we start to think about the recommendations that we're going to make for a patient to help them with their nutrition plan, uh, I think it's important to take into account kind of what things look like for them. So this is 
the messaging that's thrown at them on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a million different diets out there. Um, you know, a lot of them are very difficult to stick to. They're very restrictive. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, patients are often just done with diets. They're tired of dieting. So we need to really work with them to find an approach for nutrition that is something that they can stick to long term. And this is a great article out of um, the BMJ that had some general dietary recommendations for clinicians to give to patients and some considerations that we should take into account. So for all populations, we should be making recommendations that, um, that take into account that food quality and quantity matter. Um, we should be focused more on whole foods, not focusing on specific macro and micronutrients. And then we should consider patients' overall eating patterns um, and how those fit into their lives. Specifically for our patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity, um, we should be working with them to coordinate their nutrition plan with the medications that they're on so that they don't run into issues with hypoglycemia. It's very, very common that when I have a patient who comes in and we're just starting them on a reduced maybe a reduced carbohydrate diet from what they were eating, we often have to make medication adjustments. So I think that all these recommendations are very well embodied in a tool called the Healthy Plate. There are different versions of this you'll see out there. Um, it's used by the MOVE program at the VA, the Diabetes Prevention Program, and we also use it in our, our um, program over at Metro Health. And so the general recommendation and what we're working on getting patients towards over time is getting them to set up their plate in this format. And so I usually explain it to patients as you want to make half of your plate non-starchy vegetables. That's everything except for your corn, potatoes, and your winter squashes. You want to do a serving of a lean protein, so that's about the size of your fist. Um, and then you really want to limit your carbohydrates to uh, a quarter of your plate. And you want to select ones like non-starchy vegetables, legumes, fruit. If you're going to do grains, try to stick to more whole grains Stay away from the more processed carbohydrates as much as you can. And we know that this approach works. It works for both weight loss and it works for weight maintenance. And so um, this study looked at uh, 938 adults and they initially uh, started them on a low calorie diet to do a weight loss induction phase. And then they randomized them to different diet composi compositions. And as you can see here, the high-protein, low-glycemic index diet, which is what the healthy plate is a version of, performed the best for weight, ma weight loss maintenance um, at the 26-week mark. Um, so we know that it works well for patients. Overall, I think regardless of, you know, what sort of format you're recommending nutrition in, these are some key things that you really have to take into account for patients. So you want them to make healthy eating part of the routine. Um, you need to help them find a way that fits that with their cultural preferences and their lifestyle demands. And then you want them to become masters of flexibility so that they can adapt to whatever situation they're in. Um, Self-monitoring is very important. I personally use my fitness pal a lot. We sometimes use paper, uh, paper logging as well, but there's a variety of different apps and options out there. And then you really want to emphasize that this is adopting a healthy lifestyle. So we're trying to get away from that traditional diet mentality where you're either on or you're off. This is about the average of what you do being healthy behaviors. And then a key piece of what I do is really motivating patients to get back on track after falling off the wagon and then teaching them how to do that for themselves. So that brings us to the next piece of lifestyle modification, and that is physical activity. Um, so the current recommendations, they vary slightly depending on which organization you look at. Uh, but the middle column here, this, these are the recommendations for the physical activity for weight loss. And so on average, it's about 150 minutes per week of activity, um, usually moderate intensity. Over here on the right, we have the recommendations for weight loss maintenance. And as you can see, they're more than the recommendations for weight loss. And so and the, the, the reason for that is because as time goes on, once we lose weight, our bodies become more efficient. So we have to increase our resting energy expenditure in order to maintain that weight loss. And so on average, people are going to need around 200 to 300 minutes of that activity per week. Um, and in order to really maximize their ability to um, increase their resting energy expenditure, I work with patients a lot on incorporating um, exercises that are going to increase their lean body mass. So usually I recommend a mixture of cardiovascular conditioning and then also strength or resistance training. Um, but I will say in reality, it's a lot of just getting patients to be able to do whatever they can. 
And for a lot of our patients, they, can't, they may not be able to do the recommendation. So I have a lot of um, individuals who may have limited mobility. Um, they might have bad arthritis in their knees that limits their activity. They may have heart disease, lung issues. Um, and so, you know, we do what we can. Um, I will say water aerobics for people who can get to pools is a great option. Um, you know, we're lucky in the Cleveland area. The Cleveland rec centers often have pool access. Um, you know, the, the JCC out on the east side, YMCAs in the area. So I usually try to get people started in, in a pool setting if they can get to it. And if not, I often will start them off if, you know, they're not, not doing much and they have limited mobility. We start with chair yoga. Um, I have them use YouTube videos. So we really do whatever we can with what we have. And really, any activity is better than no activity. I think that's, that's um, a key piece here. So we talked about nutrition recommendations. We talked about activity recommendations. Um, and that brings us to the piece about behavior. So how do we actually help patients implement this? And the ideal and what is recommended for patients who have type 2 diabetes or obesity is what we call an intensive lifestyle intervention program. So this is when patients come, usually 16 visits or more over six months, and they get, in a group setting typically, um, education and coaching around behavior and ways to improve their nutrition, their physical activity, their thought process, their day-to-day -day life habits. Um, and then beyond a year, we usually transition people into more of a weight maintenance program, um, but they're still having monthly contact. They're still doing monitoring at home. And we really encourage them to, to keep up with their tracking, to keep up with the physical activity and all the changes that they've implemented. So we have some examples actually in our area of intensive lifestyle intervention programs. Um, the MOVE program at the VA is one, our STRIDES program over at Metro Health, um, any of the diabetes prevention programs, these all qualify, Weight Watchers, um, and then Take Off Pound Sensibly is actually a national program um, that individuals can use. And we know that it works. It works for type 2 diabetes and it works for weight loss long term. So the look ahead study, um, it was a randomized control trial that, as, that randomized individuals to either an intensive lifestyle intervention arm or a control group. And they found at follow up that there was a significant difference in the amount of weight loss between the intensive lifestyle intervention and the control group. So weight loss was more significant for the, the group that had gotten the intensive lifestyle intervention. That group also had better glycemic control, lower A1Cs, and reduced need for medications compared to the control. And so we can see that here. Uh, the two I just want to point out, so this is weight. This is your control here. Um, this is your intensive lifestyle intervention arm, so you can see this one's lower. And then for A1C, um, your control group is higher than your intervention at their 10-year follow-up. So intensive lifestyle intervention is very effective. The challenge is, though, that we can't always get patients there. So they may have time constraints, they may have transportation issues, mobility concerns. So there are some other options. Um, there are some commercial programs, depending on where you live, that you can have patients tap into. Um, the electronic communication programs are becoming bigger. So Noom is a popular one. It's still kind of pricey, though, um, you know, definitely out of the price range for most of the patients I take care of. Um, and then when you don't have any other options, getting close physician follow-up, dietitian, and behavioral health referrals. Um, so getting people into the clinic, touching base with them in as many ways as you can, utilizing your, um, your nurses um, and your other staff to really build a network around that patient. So for Mr. P, what we did. So um, at his first visit, we just kind of went through the healthy plate. He decided he was going to implement tracking using a photo food log. Um, which is just where I have patients take pictures of the food that they're eating, and then they have to bring it back and show it to me. Um, and then at our second visit, so we took a look at it, and he realized, you know, he was probably doing a lot of bread. Um, so he decided to replace his bread at meals with salads, um, and I had him keep track of this, so how many days a week he was able to make that change. Um, at his next visit, he decided we were going to attempt breakfast, so he started adding in a low-carbohydrate protein bar. Um, and then we got him packing lunch, and eventually, at visit five, we addressed the physical activity piece, and we got him started with some physical activity that he felt like he could do. And so I really want to stress, realize that habits are not going to change overnight. This is incremental change over time. I help patients to identify one actionable change. I have them set a SMART goal at every visit, and then we follow it up on, on it at the next visit. 
And you really want to help patients engage with the environment that they're in. So find out what resources are available to them, what things they struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis, who they interact with that might be able to help them on this journey. All right, so that takes care of lifestyle modification. The next piece I want to briefly touch on is medication, so our pharmacotherapy for the treatment of obesity. And then I'm also going to highlight the medications that we use um, that are a little bit more effective in our patients who have both obesity and type 2 diabetes. So some key tenants for medication management in this patient population. Um, you want to make sure that, especially when you have a patient who's first coming in, take a look at their medication list and really work to minimize any waking, promoting medication. So oftentimes patients will come on you know, certain antipsychotics, their diabetes regimen may be causing them to gain weight. Try to change medications as much as you can, if possible. Um, work with any sort of specialists that are helping to manage them and really see if you can get them on a better medication regimen. Uh, we want to use medication for weight loss really as an adjunctive therapy to our lifestyle modifications. And so the patients that, the, the criteria for weight loss medications is BMI of over 30 or over 27 with associated comorbidities. Um, and we really use these medications for appetite suppression, suppressions of cravings, and then also they can be used for glycemic control. Um, you want to think about when you're going to stop medication. So you want to stop them if you're not seeing that, that weight loss response. So if they're not hitting that five, around 5% 5 at three months typically, there's a lot of, there's some flexibility with that recommendation. Um, and sometimes for other reasons, if there's another indication, we may keep a person on a medication. Um, and then if they have issues with safety or tolerability. So these are just, this is kind of busy. There's some common medications that contribute to weight gain or weight loss. The ones I do want to highlight, so your antipsychotics, um, these are common offenders. I will often, you know, call people psychiatrists and say, hey, is there any way we can work around this? It's a diff the, the antipsychotics are definitely a difficult one, especially if people have been stable on a regimen for a while. Um, and so, you know, I usually leave that up to their mental health care team. Um, the ones that we do address often are their, their diabetes medications. And so, you know, um, insulin is a common offender. I have people on the sulfonylureas. Um, and we can switch patients to medicines, you know, if they tolerate them, the GLP-1s, metformin, and the SGLT-2s that are actually going to help them with weight loss instead of holding them back. So I want to touch briefly on just what the different medications that we use for weight loss are. Um, and there's a bit of a difference between the ones that are actually FDA approved and then the ones that we use that are off-label. So I will say the majority of the medications we prescribe tend to be off-label simply because the FDA-approved versions are very, very expensive. And unfortunately, at this point in time, they're not covered by a lot of third-party payers. So we're hoping that will change in the coming years. But for now, we're kind of making do with what we, what we can get for patients. So the first class of medicines, which is actually um, one of my favorites, is the GLP-1. The, the one that we have the most data on for weight loss is liraglutide. There are other ones that we certainly will use if we cannot get this for, approved for patients. Um, and usually, usually we're unable to get the FDA dosing approved. So the FDA brand is, uh, or FDA approved brand is Sexenda. And so that's a higher dosing. That's three milligrams once a day. Um, and then the off-label version, we use the Victoza, which is approved for type 2 diabetes patients. And that's the 1.8 milligram dosing. So we usually use the, um, the I'll, I'll think of a GLP-1 when I have a patient maybe who is struggling with glycemic control, if they have appetite concerns, um, where they feel like they have an excessive appetite, um, and, um, and, and we, maybe we need to do some tweaking with their diabetes medications. Um, so often in those situations, we'll be able to get that approved for a patient. It's not really an accessible treatment, though, for patients who do not have type 2 diabetes. Uh, and then that brings us to our appetite suppressant. So the, um, the two that are often combined are um, ventramine and topiramate, and they are sold under the FDA-approved brand of Qsimia. So um, the, that's, that's around, with the prescription assistance program, would be around $99 a month. Um, but often, you know, if they don't go through that, it's going to be closer to 200 Usually insurance doesn't cover it. Um, so we will often prescribe um, off-label, we'll use topiramate. Um, we can often get the FDA-approved fentramine covered, so sometimes we'll start patients on a course of fentramine and then bridge them over to topiramate afterwards. Sometimes we'll use them in conjunction. Um, so 
those medicines, I would say, are probably a little bit more commonly used. And again, they can be used for, um, you know, as long as there's no contraindication, any patient with uh, BMI over 30 um, who you're looking to assist with some appetite suppression. Now, if we have the issue of food cravings, I tend to reach a little bit more for the bupropion naltrexone combination. The FDA-approved version is Contrave. Again, that's fairly expensive for patients. Insurance doesn't usually cover it. Um, and so we use off-label um, bupropion and naltrexone and just combine the two. So it's a two-pill regimen per day. Um, very effective for, uh, for food cravings and then also has some benefit for appetite suppression as well. Um, the two, two classes we tend to use less, the lipase inhibitor, inhibitor so Orlistat. Um, the brand name is Venacol. It's sold uh, over the counter as well as Ally. A lot of issues with tolerance in this one. So um, it's a three times a day medication. Um, and it, it blocks fat absorption in the gut, and so patients tend to have a lot of steatorrhea, um, a lot of issues with GI intolerance with this. Um, and then Lorcasterin or Belvic, um, again, not covered by insurance, um, and it tends to be fairly expensive, so we, we usually stay away from that one as well. And I will say on average, you know, I always tell patients our benefit from weight loss medications is modest at best. So usually we're, we're going to hit around, the, depending on which medication you choose, around 4 to 7% weight loss. Um, but they can be very, very effective if you have a particular issue that someone's struggling with. So if you have someone who is eating a lot because they're having, you know, sweet cravings, um, using bupropion naltrexone can be very helpful. Um, you know, or if you have somebody who, um, you know, as I mentioned, maybe just struggles with appetite, choosing an agent that's going to help them with that can really, really help them on their weight loss journey. So for Mr. P, we did a, a medication um, evaluation for him. So he started off on very few medications. He was on sertraline 200, some sildenafil, hydrochlorothiazide. Um, so to start off, we started him on some metformin. Um, he actually had some intolerance to it, so we ended up stopping it. Um, he had noticed that when they went up from 100 to 200 on his sertraline, um, he hadn't noticed much of a benefit for his mood, but he had gained a lot of weight around that time. So we discussed with psychiatry, and they took that dose down to 100 again. And then eventually we added um, liraglutide 1.8 milligrams. So because he was diabetic, we were able to get that approved. And then that brings us to surgery. So um, the role of surgery for treatment of type 2 diabetes and obesity is adjunctive to lifestyle modification. So we're still doing all of the nutrition therapy, physical activity, the behavior therapy. We use medications when appropriate. This is just another tool that we have in our toolbox. Uh, and I always stress to patients, the decision to get bariatric surgery is really a, going to be a lifelong process. So you make that decision, but you're going to still continue to engage with these lifestyle changes for the rest of your life. Um, it's recommended for treatment for patients who have a BMI of over 40 or a BMI of 35 to 39.9 if they have a, an associated comorbidity. So type 2 diabetes is one of those. And um, more recently, they've been talking about potentially approving it even for the lower BMIs, specifically for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. The two main types of surgery that we have, um, and again, I'm not a surgeon, so I'm not an expert, but I will give you the brief overview. There's a lot of different variations of these. Uh, but the two main ones that we have are um, the, the one on the left uh, is the Roux and Y gastric bypass. So essentially they're creating a, um, it's a restricted process. They're creating a small pouch out of the stomach um, and reanastomosing the intestines there. Um, and there are some hormonal changes that occur as well that help with weight loss and blood sugar control. Um, and then the sleeve gastrectomy, they're removing the outer portion of the stomach here. And so that also, it's a restrictive procedure, not quite as much as the um, bypass, but it also has some, some beneficial hormonal changes associated with it. And we know that bariatric surgery works for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So the Swedish obesity study looked at um, a total of around 4,000 patients. So about 2,000 patients were in the surgical arm, 2,000 patients were in the control arm, um, and, you know, uh, around 300 in each group had um, type 2 diabetes, and they followed them for almost 20 years. And what they found is that at follow-up, um, if you can see here, so the yellow is the control group, the teal is the surgery group, and the remission rates going along, even at 15 years, were significantly higher um, in the group who had gotten surgery. So that, that's the diabetes remission rate. So we're able to actually impact 
the natural history of this disease process with bariatric surgery. So if your patient has a BMI of over 35, think about referring them for a bariatric surgery consultation. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not done often enough, and it's something that can really help our patients. So to come back to our case, Mr. P, um, after two years of hard work, he lost 34 pounds. Um, he's following a low-carb version of the healthy plate. He exercises regularly, um, wears his CPAP most of the time, and he got his A1C down to 6.4%. Um, and this really had an impact on his family. So his son had also been struggling with some weight issues, and he was able to make some dietary changes. Um, they now bond over cooking a family meal together every week, and he's still dating his girlfriend, who has been a great source of encouragement and um, a very positive source of reinforcement on his weight loss journey. So the things I want you to take home today. So obesity and type 2 diabetes are twin epidemics, and we need to treat them concurrently. Um, the treatments that we can use include interventions for diet, physical activity, behavioral therapy, and self-monitoring. You should also think about treating patients with medications and bariatric surgery um, if that's a good choice for them. The current landscape for our patients can be overwhelming and challenging, so really approach patients with compassion. This stuff is really difficult for people to talk about. They come to it often um, you know, with a lot of apprehension. Um, there's a lot of shame that comes with, with these diseases, especially the, the disease of obesity. So just be open to them, be compassionate, and, and um, you know, be as supportive for them as you can. Um, and then some resources, so the Obesity Society, the Obesity Medical Association, and the American Association of Clinical, Clinical, Clinical Endocrinologists, and the American Diabetes Association all have a wealth of resources on their website if you check those out. So the biggest thing is partnering with patients as they change their lifestyles and live better is one of the most rewarding experiences. I get to do this every day. Um, I love my job. I love working with my patients and helping them to live better lives. So thank you very much um, to Dr. Armitage and the Department of Medicine for having me today, um, and then to my, my team over at um, Metro Health, especially my mentor, Dr. Eileen Seeholzer. Um, she's helped me significantly in developing this talk. Um, and this is a picture of all of us. We occasionally get out to have fun. We got to go to Obesity Week in Las Vegas this past November and had a great time. So thank you very much, and um, if there's any questions, I can take those now. Obesity Week in Las Vegas, that sounds wild. Well, I, I want to uh, thank you for a really fantastic presentation. Just say on behalf of the training directors how proud we are of you, your career trajectory, that you're creating this unique niche for yourself. Sounds like you're really helping a lot of people, which is fantastic. So um, some of the things that are popular now are intermittent fasting, which I'm sure is hard for people to do. Do you have any comment on intermittent fasting? I have so many comments on intermittent fasting. Okay. <laughs> um, so that was actually a very hot topic at Obesity Week this past year. Um, there, there is a lot of data coming out about the metabolic benefits, and we think that a lot of the, um, the, more, the longevity benefits that we're seeing from it actually relate to decreased insulin exposure over time. Um, in terms of practicality for my patients, a lot of times the version of intermittent fasting that I see my patients doing is I skip breakfast, I skip lunch, I get fast food at Burger King for dinner, and that's my intermittent fast. So I often try to focus on patients, um, you know, certainly if I have someone who's already been successful and is doing it in a healthy way, we'll stick with that. Uh, but more often I walk them towards getting, you know, three meals a day that are balanced with some snacks in between. Cool. And you know probably from talking to me when you were here, I have this overly simplistic view of the world that it's all insulin levels and metabolic syndrome. And, and what do you say to that overly simplistic sort of Van Zosen approach to weight loss? So. So I think that we unfortunately don't know all the intricacies in this area yet. Um, I think that um, there is a lot, of, a lot of research coming out, and I think that insulin um, plays a significant role. I think the picture is maybe a little bit more nuanced that we can appreciate. There are certainly, I think there's evidence that, that emerging that there are different phenotypes of obesity, um, and different people will respond in, in various ways. But I, I definitely adhere to that. I, you know, because we don't, in, in absence of good evidence and good information, um, you know, I often work with patients to try different things and see what works. But the first approach we'll usually take is uh, reducing carbohydrates and, and incorporating those lower glycemic index foods. And then somebody emailed me a question. Um, if you do intermittent fasting, eat a healthy breakfast and lunch, and don't eat dinner but have a glass of wine, does that kind of intermittent fasting. This is an email I got, I, I swear. It's not something I made up. It's, it's a version.
version of it. Um, so I do like the, usually I do consultations that they are going to do intermittent fasting. Try to get your, your food, the bulk of your food, actually earlier in the day, so that fits with the breakfast and lunch. Um, I typically counsel my patients overall to stay away from, from alcohol um, simply because of the, the metabolic consequences of it. Um, however, you know, I don't, I don't think that's the worst, the worst way to do it. I would give that one probably a B plus as a plan. Thanks. Carrie, I had a question from the, uh, the audience. Um, can you comment on the keto diet and kind of your, I guess, thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's one that also comes up commonly. Um, so the ketogenic diet, um, it can be done in a way that is somewhat healthful. Um, I think that it needs, one of the challenges with it is really someone who's doing it, especially someone with underlying medical conditions, needs very close monitoring. Uh, there are a lot of electrolyte shifts that can occur when people switch into ketosis. And so especially for our patients who may have you know, CKD or heart disease, um, they really should be getting lab draws at routine intervals and be monitored by a physician who has some experience with that. Um, you know, I think we don't know, and, and there's no evidence um, to date because this is, is a relatively newer thing for the adult population. Um, we don't have a great sense of what the long-term consequences of it are. Um, so I do have patients who will come in and, and they are, you know, maybe they're starting off on keto, um, and I still do the same emphasis for them, really increasing the vegetables, um, trying to stick to more whole foods, less processed, and, um, you know, and just trying to eat a healthier diet overall. I guess I had a question for you. So I, I think I've heard patients tell me sometimes that their insurer will pay for like a gym membership or something like that. Is that something that's common or have you had experience with using that or having insurance insurers pay for that? Yes, in some cases that is the case. Um, and it's wonderful if they do that. Um, the majority of my patients are, are, I would say a good portion of them are Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so it's not as common for the Medicaid patients. I don't, don't really see that. For Medicare, so sometimes people can get Silver Sneakers memberships with their Medicare, um, and that is a really big asset. So it will get them, you know, YMCA and other fitness facilities. That's been a big way that I've been able to get people into aqua therapy, actually. So um, it's always good. I always encourage them to call and ask and see if that's an option. Any other questions? Carol, I want to thank you for coming back to alma mater, doing a grand rounds. It's virtual. In the uh, in the era of social distancing, it was really fantastic, and we're grateful you came back. And thanks very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Carrie.